have three goals in life that have turned into the end of life goals. I want to meet all three of those goals, but I am hoping that at the end of my days that everyone will say these three things about me. And it is the trigger that drives my life. I hope at the end of my life, my goals right now, the top three, number one, that he never, ever quit. Second, that he lived his life to please God. And number three, he was always faithful to contend for the faith and the vision of North Elevation Church. Now I'm going to hit the pause button for a moment. And what I'm about to do is not here to exclude anybody. It is to make a point that is going to become very real by the end of this message. Anyone and everyone that's in this building tonight that you've been with Pastor Jeff since the planting of TPC, would you please stand if you're here tonight? When this church was planted, you got one, two, I see them standing up in the back back here. This is not to exclude anyone, but I want everyone to, to begin to focus in on where we're gonna go, because contend is a key word tonight. All of you that are standing, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for being faithful to contend for the faith and for the vision of Turning Point Church that God gave Pastor Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. There are a lot of books in the Bible that are important, and there's 66 of them, but in the Bible there are books that have been forgotten. And at the top of my list that I find that people don't read much that's been forgotten is Jude, the book of Jude. It's a very fascinating book in the New Testament, just 461 words. You probably think there's just nothing in there. It's just 461 words. Why bother to read it? Within that book, I find a minimum of five sermons. There are lessons and insights to discover in this very unique book. But tonight, we're gonna to land only on the first four verses. We're gonna look at who is the author. We're gonna take a look at why did he write it? Who was he writing it to? Because it's very important, the book of Jude, because of the word contend. So we'll read in Jude 1. It says, from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Most theologians agree that he was the half-brother of Jesus. So this is who's speaking. Now, who did Jude write to? It says in verse 1, to those who are called wrapped in the love of God, the Father, and kept by Jesus Christ. Now, he's talking to the way. That was the church then, the way. So this book is speaking on this night to the church. The church is not this building. You are the church. You're a community of faith here, but you as the individual are the church. So Jude is speaking to us tonight, and he wants to talk to us about contending. Now, why did he write the letter? Let's look at that, verse three and verse four, but he says something interesting in the midst of this. In verse three, he says, beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you, key word, exhorting, you to contend earnestly, two more key words, for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Once and for all delivered to the saints. Verse four, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out of this condemnation, 
ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. What is interesting within this, Jude originally intended to write to them about salvation. But now all of a sudden he feels compelled. He felt this persisting need to talk about contending for the faith. Let's say it a different way. He was talking to them about, I need you to contend for the truth. We're not going to talk about salvation. There is a great need to contend for the truth. In America, there is a great need for the church to contend for the, chur- for the truth. And so he feels compelled to shift gears from where he was going to go, and he wants to exhort them, encourage them to contend earnestly for the faith. Now, I have a pen truth I'm going to share with you tonight. Follow me on this. The faith here doesn't mean our own personal belief. The phrase The faith means here is the essential truths of the gospel that all of us should hold in common. The essential truths of this book. Jude is saying to the church, I need you to stand up and contend earnestly for the essential truths of the word of God. This phrase used like this Concerning faith, the faith is used in this sense repeatedly in the New Testament. And I could give you a whole list of places that that happens. So the book of Jude is written as a reminder to us that one of our primary purposes as the church, yes, we want to go reach people for Jesus Christ and for salvation. But how are you going to do that? You're going to have to contend for the truth. You've got to contend for the faith. Let me give you a couple of definitions from the King James Dictionary. Contend. To use earnest efforts to defend and preserve. Did you know that the church is supposed to defend this word? Not back up. Step forward. When somebody rails against this word, we should step up and contend for the faith. We are to preserve this gospel, and we can't preserve it if we're not out there talking about it. He said, contend earnestly for the faith. King James, dictionary, talking about earnestly. That was the other key word. With fixed attention, I love this, with eagerness. I need everybody smiling, with eagerness. When you go to work tomorrow, he said, I got to do this with eagerness. And that lady over there is always talking bad about it, and I got to stand up with eager. Eager. I got to be eager. I got to have some eagerness here. Yeah. To contend for the word of God, and I'm going to give you reasons to be eager. Somebody needs you to have some energy tomorrow and defend and preserve the faith. Someone needs you to have a fixed attention on the eagerness to share the gospel. That's how you contend for the faith. You contend for the faith. We've got to start contending for the faith. So we have Jude here who interrupted his intended letter to exhort them to contend for the faith. Why would he do such a thing? Because this is the most valuable thing on planet Earth. On this planet, this is the most valuable thing. This is precious. It needs to be preserved and it needs to be contended for. Let me give you for an example, and I've been in one. You ever been in a, you go into museums? If you walked into a museum and there was no guards, 
And the way technology is today, you know where the technology is, the security. If you walked into a museum and there were no guards and no security cameras, cameras, you would begin to decide and come to the conclusion that there's nothing in here of value, correct? If we don't defend the faith, we're telling people it's not valuable. If we're not out there preserving the truth, we're telling them it's not worth preserving, it's not important. Because this is the most valuable thing on planet Earth. Jude uses something here when you tie it down into the reality of what he was trying to connect with. He said, exhorting you, beginning to speak to the individual. Jude was speaking to the individual and he expected that each individual Christian would contend for the faith. Through the years, I had people tell me, they said, well, you just, it's just your job. Well, before I was in ministry and I was working out there, it was still my job. And the truth is, there are days that I long for those days past because there was, God was doing some cool things in the workplace. We are to contend for the faith, whatever position we have. Wherever we are, we have to contend for the faith. Jude expected for each individual to contend for the faith. Jude had a deep concern for this treasure of faith being threatened. What does he say? Now, I'm going to take you into our world here in just a moment. This book is still very important in this day, speaking loudly to us. In verse four, it says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed. If you have your cell phone with you, hold your cell phone up. I'm gonna make a point. Just hold your cell phone up. Ungodly people are creeping into the church through that device. Times have changed, you can put them down. They can creep into the church. And I know you have a strong leadership here look, that are gonna protect you. But I'm telling you, and today, we have the outside creeping into the inside without having to even come in. I've said a few things in our church a couple times, not too long ago, some things. But in times past, I know that when you're looking at your phone, you're just reading scriptures with me. What is creeping in when we should be contending with the faith, for the faith? Are we contending for the message that Pastor Jeff is preaching? Or are we distracted with the newest app that just came out? Should we review our apps and see what we need to get rid of? What is pulling me away from contending with the faith? I'm being serious here. Let me give you a for example of how powerful the outside coming into the inside without men creeping in as it was in his day. Now they're creeping in and they're using technology. In one of our services a few years ago, I was preaching on tithing. And I know everybody in here, you just love to tithe, don't you? Yeah, amen. Say it real loud so that, you know, everybody on camera sees it, Pastor Jeff sees it, you enjoy it, yeah. Tithing. I'm preaching on tithing. And I see somebody get up that's new. That's not uncommon. You're in a theater. I'm looking at everybody like this. You don't miss nothing. They go out, and then I notice some of my key people are going, they're not, they don't normally look at their phones, but their phones are going off. And I mean, and it starts happening in several places in the theater. I'm preaching on this, and this guy had the knowledge to hack their friend's phone that they were sitting by, hack their phone list, captured that phone list, not knowing where all it would go, and it started hitting and pinging people in our service while he preached another gospel about giving.
We live in a time and an age where we have got to wake up and contend for the faith. When I found out about that, the next week I had to come back and do some things. I, during the week I had to talk to some people that got that and was a little confused all of a sudden, wondering where this was coming from. You need to be praying. Oh man, warfare, prayers. Contending for the faith. We live in a very unusual time. But unfortunately, I see a lot of church people have some flawed realities about what it means to contend for the faith. So, since Pastor Jeff's got me up here, I'm gonna talk to you about some of them. Let me share with you some keys to contending with the faith. You wanna hear some keys to contending with the faith? For the faith? Let me give you some keys. Number one, contending for the faith is not complacency. It is challenging the culture. How do you challenge the culture? How are you gonna challenge the culture? You have gotta be on the offensive. You can't sit idly by. The key word in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 is go. When somebody asks me, how do I contend for the faith? Go. <laughs> go live the life as preached from the gospel that's brought to you in the classes from this pulpit from one of the most dynamic preachers I know who is a, I mean, Let's come, he's not afraid to tell the truth. You get the truth, and you need to go out these doors and go with that truth and live it and contend for the faith. You just can't sit back. You gotta get out there. You gotta do something with it. But here's what I see. A lot of Christians are content in living a passive Christianity. I call them camouflage Christians. We want to blend in. We want it to be easy. We want it to be want a calm day. I would have taken about 10 of those in the last seven days. When you're contending for the faith, when you're contending for vision, you're going to have to fight and you fight that battle with the word of God and you've got to know that word. You've gotta contend for the faith. I was here several years ago, you may not remember it, I was dressed in camouflage. For what reason? God woke me up one night and he said, my church is camouflaged. Wake the church up. We can't be camouflaged Christians. I know it's easier, I get it. But you have the power of heaven back in you. Amen. You have to contend for the faith. Let me remind you who you are, who I am. Matthew five fourteen says, you are the light of the world. Wow. You're the light of the world. If the Lord Jesus Christ is your king, savior, who you worship, you are the light of the world. The verse goes on to say, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Get your light out from under the basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Wherever you are, what light are you producing? That light is contending for the faith. Did you know in a lot of situations, you don't even have to open your mouth if you'll just be a Christian and live the right way. 
You're contending for the faith. You're living the truth. Now, people like Pastor Jeff and I, we can't keep our mouths shut, but, you know, we're going to say something. Matthew 5, 13 says, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. Salt was used for a lot of different things. It was used, it was more priceless than gold. That's how precious you are. It was used to heal wounds. Did you know you're here to preserve? (laughs) Not here to create wounds, but to heal wounds. You are the salt of the earth. You're here to make a difference. And then the last part of 13 says, but if the salt has lost its taste, and Amplified says purpose, then we are not going to contend for the faith. You have to stay salty. Not just come hear the word, but respond to it. Somebody said, ask me all the time, how do I respond to the message? Go do it. <laughs> Go live it. If it, if, it, if it clicked in something inside you, if it touched something, if it pricked you, let it do its work. And contend for the faith. Listen, contend for the faith by letting the word work on you and bring you to where you're supposed to be. Don't push it out, let it come in. What I love about Jesus is when he was talking to them, he did not say being salt and light was an option. Read it. He didn't say it was an option. He didn't say you can be someday. He said you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. He's speaking to us. You're the salt of this earth. You're a light to the world. If you're a king's kid, that's who you are. And you're called to contend for the faith. Number two, contending for the faith is not comatose contentment. I use a pretty strong word there because I make, I'm, I'm just being honest. You can't have comatose commitment. It is determined comprehension. What do I mean by that? Too many think that the ignorance of the Bible and the word is a good thing. Not accountable. Didn't know that. And so we take a back seat. Can I be honest with you tonight and be truthful with you? Ignorance of this word is dangerous. It's dangerous not to know this word. I hope you know you live in America, and it's dangerous not to know this word now. You gotta know the word of God. And you gotta know it if you're gonna contend for it. You gotta know the word. I tell people all the time, say, don't just read the Bible, live it. It's not enough to read it, live it. When you're reading the scripture, start seeing yourself living what you're reading. Live it. Let me give you two reasons we must be knowledgeable in our faith. Number one, defend against the corruption of the message of the world. You need to know this. And I know you live and breathe and walk within a community here that it's all about this book. Start absorbing it and knowing it. Number two, to be able to give us, listen to this, to give a sound, consistent, understandable answer for our faith when asked. I used to do singles ministry, did that for over a decade, my wife Rochelle and I, that's how we cut our teeth in ministry. And the singles were always bringing people to me. I said, what's this? And they said, well, they asked me a question. I said, you could answer it. And I thought, 
man, I'm doing a bad job. (laughs) And I started realizing I had to step it up because these young people needed to be able to give a consistent, understandable answer to the questions they were being asked. I need to take them deeper. So they can contend for the faith. Because when they bring them to me, the person had already set up walls that had been broken down when they connected with them. And things could have been a lot different. Wouldn't have been as hard. Know this word. And don't let the deceiver, Satan, tell you that you cannot learn it like the person next to you. Yes, you can. Don't let him tell you, well, when I read it, I just don't get anything out of it. You stop that lie and you say, no, I have the mind of Christ. I can understand this. I'm a king's kid. I'm gonna get revelation from it. The Holy Spirit is going to show me things I've never seen before. Satan, I resist that message. I refuse to accept that message. This is life and I will receive it. You need to start speaking words of faith. That's contending for the faith. That's contending for the truth. Man, I could just start rattling off lots of scriptures. Contend for the faith. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16 says, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. Watch this. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. He didn't say, think about it. He didn't say, once a week, once a month. The moment somebody asks you, you need to be able to explain it. And I know there's things going on all over this place where you could learn how to do that. Always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Well, pastor, I always have an answer. Yeah, I saw the countenance on your face. I wouldn't receive it either. Well, I don't have a bad countenance on on my face. Well, your wife's looking at you like you do. (laughs) I had a problem with that. And I told my wife, I said, I just quit. I give up. I love people. She said, I know you love people. I said, I just want to help them. I just keep running them off. And she said, go look in the mirror. You got to know her. She has, there's no shortcuts. And here's what I did. Morning after morning, day after day. You may think it's foolish, but I wanted to contend for the faith and win people to Christ. I'd get up at 5, 5.30 in the morning, go straight to the bathroom, look in the mirror, and say, Father, <laughs> Order my steps today and take control of my countenance. I have the, not only the mind of Christ, I'm gonna reflect Christ. And every morning I'd get up and I'd begin to declare scriptures and I'd begin to speak to, speak to, speak back to myself. You'll have a smile on your face. You won't have this scowl on your face. You can be different. You don't have to be this, well, that's just my personality. No, you can have a whole new personality. You want to contend for the faith? Let God change you. It was amazing. All of a sudden, people liked being around me. It was scary. My question, and one of my lead elders here and another member of our church here is not, and they'll tell you. My question is, do you love people? All kinds of people? then let the word 
work on you. Because it's all about people. You know why I'm here tonight? Yes, Pastor Jeff invited me to come. Yes, I have a word for you tonight, but you know why I'm here? Because I love you. I love you. I'm not here for any other reason. If I can help, I want to help. Because I love you. And I want you to walk in the fullness of what God has for you. I love this church. There's greater things ahead. And there'll be even bigger things ahead when the church rises up and starts contending for the faith. I have another pin fact. Scripture never condemns getting, gaining knowledge. I've had that thrown at me. It is the world's wisdom that God considers as foolishness. Not this. You need to gain all the knowledge you can get from this book. I tell people, read books. I do. I read them, listen to them. I got them going all the time. But nothing I do outdistance my time in this book. And that's not because I'm pastoring. My wife will tell you it's always been that way. Number three, well, wait a minute. I I got to. Let me give you 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the story and message of the cross is sheer absurdity, folly to those who are perishing and on their way to perdition. But to us who are being saved, it is the manifestation of the power of God. You have the power of God right here to change your world if you'll contend for the faith. Verse 19 says, for it is written, I will baffle and render useless, destroy the learning of the learned and the philosophies of the philosophers and the cleverness of the clever and the discernment of the discerning. I will frustrate and nullify them and bring them to nothing. Every time I read that, I go, oh, Father, if I'll just contend for the faith, that will happen. Contend for the faith. How's he gonna do that? He's gonna do it through you. Stephen, they tried to argue with him and they couldn't get anywhere. And I'm believing for a church that's gonna walk in that. Number three, contending for the faith is not being obnoxious and difficult. I almost brought you my message from this Sunday. My message this Sunday was about how to love difficult people. Someday that's coming. How to love difficult people. Contending for the faith is not being obnoxious and difficult. It is having a compassionate concern. A compassionate concern for people. Ephesians 6.12 says, for our fight, this is something we have to remember. I'm gonna remind you of this because you're not dealing with people most all the time. You're dealing with a spirit behind the scenes. Love people, all kinds of people, and realize you have an enemy that is trying to destroy people. And we have to contend for the faith. For our fight, conflict, struggle is not against people on earth, flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and the powers, cosmic powers, rulers of this world's darkness against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly realm. We are in a war against principalities and powers of the air and darkness in heavenly realms that are working many times through people. So you have a smile on your face. You go, oh God, I gotta be kind to them today. I gotta gotta contend for the faith. Love 
difficult people. Because you may be the only person and you don't realize it that will reach them if you'll stand up and contend for the faith. Sometimes you're contending for the faith is have the countenance of Christ on your face. You may not say one word, but the countenance of Christ, the love of Christ in you is contending for the faith and they are drawn to that difference. Love people. All kinds of people. We've always said this in the church, goes all the way back to when I first got saved in 83. I heard it all the time. Hate the sin, love the sinner. We had songs about that. Come on, some of you are my age. You remember them. Can I give you a new way to, to view that? Stand firm. I'm going to say it again. Stand firm and love well. Stand firm and love well. And the more of the kingdom, power of the word of God that's in you, you can love well. And you can stand firm. I'm the vice chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission. I'm only bringing this up for a reason. I'm the vice chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission for the city of Mansfield. It's not a small city anymore. And we had something going on the other night. And in love, I countered something. It's not good for the city where it was going. It wasn't good for citizens either. And I countered something. And I stood firm. But in love, and it turned. It'll work everywhere that you're at. I took a stand, but in love, standing in the reality that the word of God helps me no matter what I'm doing. When I take that hat off, my pastor's hat, I put on my P and Z hat, I'm still a Christian. <laughs> I'm still a Christian. I always see people, I say, man, who are you? You're not the person I met at church yesterday. You can't be camouflaged when you walk out the door because church didn't end, church just left. And we can't be camouflaged. Let me give you my final statement for the evening that I have penned for sake of time. So stay with me with this, please. Jude's letter had a twofold purpose. He wanted to expose the false teachers that had infiltrated the Christian community. False teachers are coming from, uh, to us in all new ways. And he wanted to encourage Christians to stand firm in the faith and fight for the truth. The message is still the same. It's still relevant right now, this moment. The book of Jude is the very definition of punchy. Now I'm going to meddle a little bit. Are y'all ready? It's punchy, forceful proclamations with short commands and statements. I like to say his words popped off the page like a machine gun firing off. But in our day and age, punchy or hard hitting has become rude or unacceptable. In many circles, the for forcefulness of Jude will not be tolerated. I'm talking churches. The crowds preferring a softer, gentle, gentler gospel so they don't feel compelled to change. However, <laughs> Jude reminds us that there is a time and a place for the aggressive protection of the truth from those who would seek to tear it down. We are to be world changers, not be changed by the world. We have got to contend for the faith. Do not be afraid. Of the truth. I'm going to say it again. Do not be afraid of the truth. It will set you free. 
It will set you free. I heard a message and probably catch him on the radio. Something. He said something. I want to pull over the road and get saved again. Receive the truth and change. And tomorrow you're going to contend for the faith on a level you didn't the day before. We must all understand that God loves us so much. I'm bringing this message because I love you, God loves you, because I want you <laughs> to see all your dreams come to pass, all your family come into the kingdom. Watch the people in your building come to Jesus. And you don't have to wait on the lady on the other side that you hear praying. Let her pray, you go talk to somebody. Go live it. Everybody thinks they gotta have the command of the word of God. You need to be working on that. But if you'll just go live it, <laughs> it's amazing. The simple questions they'll ask you and you'll find out because you've been sitting in this place, you have the answers. You have the answers. I have one simple question to ask tonight as we end. Would you stand and make this personal? Don't do this for the person next to you. I'm serious. Don't do this for any other reason. Would you stand and make a personal commitment that I'm gonna take the next step, whatever that step is, and I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna contend for the faith. Would you stand? Is that you? You're gonna contend for the faith. You may be contending for the faith on a level I'm not even contending for the faith. But I tell you what, there's new, there's new levels you haven't even walked into yet. If you're open to them. If you're open to them. Now the last thing I'm gonna ask, however you worship God, whatever your prayer posture is when you're standing, whether that's with your head bowed and your hands folded or whether it's with your hands up, Whatever your surrender is when you're standing before God, move into that posture right now and surrender to him. Father God, most high God, Yahweh, you are the lily of the valley. You are the bright and morning star. Yeah. You're the lion of Judah. You are the beginning and the end. You are truly the Alpha and Omega. <laughs> and absolutely no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And we are going to step up and step out and contend for the faith. We're going to move out and we're going to move up. So Father, tonight, as we surrender in our moment to you, we surrender our fears. We surrender, we, we surrender our worries of what will happen if I do. We surrender our lack of confidence that I won't know what to say and I'm gonna receive I will know what to say even told the disciples, don't think about what you're about to do. I'll fill your mouth. Father, I thank you. You'll fill my mouth. You'll give me the words to say. Holy Spirit, I surrender right now and ask you to order my steps starting tonight for tomorrow. When I awaken and my feet hit the ground, I'm going to believe you're going to order my steps so I can contend for the faith and bring glory to your name. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this church. I thank you for Pastor Jeff, Cindy, and all the leadership here and everybody that works so hard to love people. I thank you for the people that are in here that God just hunger for you.
come on a Wednesday night you got to be hungry Father fill them now in Jesus name